Welcome to No Greater Love, an audio outreach of Westminster Calvary. Please grab your Bible and join with us as Pastor Jeff teaches through the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, I've titled today's message, Did I Get It Right? We're starting off with the question, did I get it right? It's a powerful question because so often as we go through our natural experiences in life, if you will, we go through times where we doubt. Have, has anybody ever experienced that before? Doubt? Show, let me show, show a hand. Okay, some of you guys have doubted. Some have walked on water, but most have doubted. That's good. <laughs> That's a great thing, right? Well, you know, we, we get to this place of doubt because, you know, we're, we're only people. We cannot see the end of our circumstance from the beginning of our circumstance. And oftentimes we're left in this place where there's a quandary that falls upon the heart because we don't know how a given situation will turn out. And so naturally, what do we do? Naturally, we go to that place to rely upon sensory input, if you will. You know, that, that input that comes from our thoughts, that input that comes from our emotions. And, and while God has created our senses, no doubt, we also understand that as we examine Scripture, that God is greater than our thoughts, that God is greater than our emotions. The book of Isaiah would declare that, that His ways are above our ways and past our finding out. And we see so many times that going through the pages of Scripture that there are people that absolutely experience God at a greater level, that is beyond the level of the natural laws that you and I live in every day. And today, as we jump in here at this section of Scripture, we're going to find that the disciples are in a situation, that they're in a tough spot, and the circumstances around them have stirred their emotions to this place because they're in real danger. Real danger. And what happens? Well, their faith is tested. And you and I get to sit back here on a Sunday morning and kind of navigate our way through this but there's so much practical information for us to take out in these few verses. So many things that can help our steps to walk with Jesus, to help us to rely upon the sufficiency of Christ. And it is the sufficiency of Christ that changes our lives, gang. You know, we're in a day and an age here where we're so consumed with uh, digital technology, electronic technology, and I love it. I'm a consumer of that. I dig it. As I said before, man, I'm, I'm addicted to my iPhone. So, I mean, I... You know, I, I don't carry it up here on Sunday morning because I'd probably be up here checking it and texting it or something. Doing, you don't understand. You guys are doing it. <laughs> yeah. But gang, we want to make progress in the gospel. You know, we've, we've gotten this far to chapter 8 so far. You know, but I want to make sure that we're continuing to grow in the understanding of God. That we're, that we're in this place that we can go through and that, that as we recognize God's word, as it becomes familiar to our heart, that you and I recognize the presence of God. You recognize his voice speaking to you that when you're going through your day and all of a sudden there's a verse that comes to the forefront of your mind, you go, I get it. God is speaking to me. He's got something to say to me. And he is able to handle every situation that we face. You know, uh, has anybody ever heard of the um, uh, musician, David Crowder? Raise your hand again. I got it. Okay, good. Oh, yeah. This side is, you guys are the more cool side. Let's try that again. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> he, he's, one of his newer songs, he says this. He says, earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. There's no sorrow that, that heaven can't heal. And, and, and what is he talking about? You know, it, it's the elimination of doubt. It, it's the sufficiency of Christ. It's the great work of our God in the person of Jesus Christ. Because you and I, if we can get into these situations where certainty and security that they feel like they're elusive, if you will. That they feel like, oh, no, there is no security in this. And yet the Word of God would tell us that in Christ, that Jesus covers our past, our presence, and our future. There's nothing that's hidden from Him, and there's nothing that He will not carry us through. And so often we get to that place, and it's like we want to abandon the boat and jump out. Jesus would say, no, 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 no. Hang on. I've got you covered. I will take care of you. Well, as we went through the last few topics, and I'm just going to catch us up here as, as a group, because I know that, uh, you know, invariably, um, well, invariably we miss out on some things. And so 
Uh, over the past course, uh, the past three studies that we've gone through right here, we have traveled through three weeks ago. We were at that place of the power of grace. And we saw God's grace working, the goodness of God helping in the affairs of mankind. And we learned that in that message that God is so willing to reach out, that he's willing to do abundantly above all that we can ask or all that we can think. And we moved on and we came, came to last week. And last week, we were at that place of the next step. We titled the message The Next Step. And in that, we evaluated as, as Jesus tested discipleship. There was two particular disciples that were tested, one that was overzealous and one that was underzealous. And now today we come to this place after the next step and we come to this place of asking, hey, did I get it right? It's a powerful question. It's a real question. It's a question that speaks to us in a very practical way because day by day, we might try to follow what the Lord has in the scriptures and we might try to walk that out. And then all of a sudden we look around and we go, whoa, 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 whoa. Jesus said to do this, but look at where I'm at. Can this really be of God with all these things falling and crashing down around me? Can Jesus really be in the middle of this? Did I really hear from him? We begin to ask these questions. Did I get it right? And that's the question of today's message. Did I get it right? I want to make sure that as we walk out of here today that you can answer that question and I pray that this study, as we look at these few verses here, that God ministers to you and he shows you something powerful and that he underscores the sufficiency of his love for your life. In every circumstance, the sufficiency of his love. Look with me in verse number 23. So Matthew writes this. He says, now, when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him. Who got in the boat? Let's do it with confidence. Wait, wait, hang on, wait, wait. Uh, are we doing the right thing here, right? You know, did I make the right decision? Okay, let me, let me read it. I'm going to have you guys follow along, okay? So now, when he got into a boat, his, dis, uh, his disciples followed him. Who got in the boat? You guys know that. You guys know that. Just reading one verse, you guys already know that. It was Jesus that was getting into the boat. Some of your cool Bibles may have he capitalized, which is awesome. Kind of tips you off that we're talking about Jesus. Totally cool. But the, the, the scene for these particular verses, as we recognize in the last, you know, preceding text, is that here they are, they're at the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee. And it's called the Sea of Galilee, but really this body of water is more like a lake than an ocean. You know, it, it, it's a body of water that from north to south, they say it's about 13 miles long. Not too far. And, 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 and from uh, west to east, or east to west, you know, from the, the two different uh, shorelines there, it's about seven to eight miles across, depending upon what guy you ask. I don't know if the shores go like this. Maybe he was measuring at high and low tide. There it is. They got a mild beach, the best beaches in the world. Go there. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it, it's anywhere from seven to eight miles wide. Now, the Sea of Galilee here, scholars also say this about it, is that it sits 680 feet below sea level. What's the altitude here in Denver? It's a mile high, 5,280, right? That's it. Well, because this Sea of Galilee kind of drops down there and it's 680 feet below sea level, it's a place that becomes a great candidate for storms. And what scholars have noted over the course of time is, is that the cold air that falls from Mount Hermon, which is just north, it's about 9,000 feet above sea level. And so in practicality, we've got almost, Almost a 10,000 uh, foot variance there between the Sea of Galilee and the top of Mount Hermon. A substantial difference. But that cold air falls down. And when it comes down the mountain and it comes down the valley and drops down into the, the region of the Sea of Galilee, what happens is it collides with the warm air that is on the Sea of Galilee. And what's, what happens from that is it creates these rapid storms that are really radical. It, it, the wind comes blowing in and... and I have literally heard people that have said that the, the waves on this little sea can turn to be as high as 15 feet tall. Now, I'm a guy from San Diego. I grew up in San Diego. I spent a lot of time at the beaches. You know, and, and when they wouldn't close the beach down, hey, we would get out there as young teenagers and jump in that water. And, dude, we were hoping for some big waves like that. We never had anything like this at 15 foot. But I'll tell you this, that there had been many times where I was pressed under, you know, under these turbulence of the of the storms and all that stuff. And it's a scary thing. 
When you get taken under with a wave and you go down, you know, you're surfing, you're bodyboarding, whatever you're doing, and you get trapped underneath, all of a sudden, you're doubting whether you're going to see the light of day again. It's a scary thing that presses upon your heart. Well, we find this to be true of Christian life as well. Because the storms can rapidly appear in our life, gang. One minute we're walking with Jesus and all seems to be going well. That everything is great. No problems. It's all good. And the next thing you know, we're in the middle of a great storm. And we've got these waves crashing all around us. Things just happen. And it's part of life. Do you guys remember the story of Job? Let's turn there for just a half a second, okay? Flip to the Old Testament. Uh, for those of you that are still trying to determine where the books are, um, if you went to the very center of your Bible, which is somewhere around Psalm 118, somewhere in that general area, uh, it would be to your left, one book. It's Job, Job chapter 1, it's on page 701. Oh wait, that's just for my Bible. But in chapter 1, we find this. We find that in verse number 8, that we see that, that Satan has presented himself in the throne room of God or up in heaven there at some point. And uh, in verse 8 it says, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and an upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? What does that look like? Practically in Job's life, things are going well. Things are good. There's not a storm in sight. It's all good. He's walking in obedience with the Lord and things are great. Now, all of a sudden, we look down just a few verses. We see that, that Satan was, uh, he acknowledged that God had put a hedge around him and that he had blessed him and so forth. And, and God's bragging on Job. And all of a sudden, he allows Job access to his life, you know, to, to stretch out his hand and touch him, if you will. And we get down to verse number 13, and it says this. He says, now, there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in the oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them when the Sabians raided them and took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And the story goes on. And while he was still speaking, another also came and he said, The fire of God fell from heaven, and he burned up the sheep and the servants, and he consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another also came and he said, The Chaldeans formed three bands. Are you guys getting the picture of this? There is a radical storm that just fell over the top of Job's life like that. One day it was all well. He was doing good. Things were cool. God's bragging on him. And the next thing you know, he's in the middle of this storm. A crazy storm swept over the top of him. And one of the common ways that the enemy loves to take and apply pressure to us is through our finances, through our family, and ultimately through our health. When he messes with your health, there's a way that it just slows you down. And those are the three common tactics, I guess, that we see coming out of the book of Job, that the attacks of the enemy, um, finances, family, and health. Three things there. It doesn't really have much to do about with what we're studying here today, but I wanted to demonstrate to you that from the scriptures, while, while you can be walking in a place where all is well, and then you're, the next thing you know, you're in a crazy storm. Well, look back to our text here in, verse, um, in Matthew, Matthew 8 and 24. In verse 24, Matthew writes, he says, And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so the boat was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. I want us to get us a fuller picture of this, so I'm going to read to you the parallel passages. One comes out of Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 38. And you don't have to flip there. You can just listen if you'd like. And it says this. It says, On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, this is Jesus, let us cross over to the other side. And now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And the other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose and the waves beat into that boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern asleep on a pillow. Another passage of this parallel passage is this comes out of Luke chapter 8. And Luke shades it this way in verses 22 and, and uh, uh, 23. He says, Now it happened on a certain day that he got into a boat with his disciples. And he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side of the lake. And they launched out. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, 
and they were filling with water and were in jeopardy. A much fuller picture here, gang, as we, as we kind of branch out a little bit farther and we take a look at, at what was going on. But we see these disciples in the place where they're in the right of their life. And right in the middle of their big problems, in the right of their life, and physically they're in a situation, all of a sudden, Jesus is asleep in the stern. You know, I thought we were singing, Jesus, take the wheel. How's he going to take the wheel when he's asleep? I mean, he's wiped out. He's asleep up there in the stern. Little side note for ministry workers, you know, as, as we see this, you know, it's okay to be tired in the work. It's completely okay. As you serve Jesus, you're going to get tired in the work. But guess what? It's never okay to be tired of the work. Jesus was tired in the work. He was tired, and he naturally, he just fell asleep. Such a rest and a confidence in his his heavenly father, that even though the waves are crashing about it, he's up there sawing logs on a pillow. I need sleep like that in my life. I mean, that I don't get disrupted by these storms that blow through my life because when they come, it seems like they come at such a tempo and such a pace that, man, it disrupts everything about you. Gang, we need to remember that these are seasoned fishermen here and they are li literally in a place of real danger and they knew it. And at times, Jesus leads us into these storms of our life. And when we go into these storms, we find that we come face to face with difficult situations, difficult decisions, complex problems within our lives. You know, Jesus brings us into these storms where they seem to stir up high emotions. And the anxiety, it hits the roof. and We freak out. They're real. And when we get to that particular place, invariably, we go to that place of asking questions like, watch, did I make the right choice? Did I make the right choice in that decision? Did I follow the right counsel? Okay, you know, the Bible says that in a multitude of counselors that there is wisdom. Well, I've gotten this counsel, and now look at where I'm at. Now look at the mess that I'm in. Did I get the right counsel? You know, we start... We start doing the, you know, the, the pat down. Okay, where's the sin? Now, some of you guys are just looking at me like I'm crazy. So, for those of you that have done the pat down, let me see. Am I the only one? Okay, a few. Okay, good. We, you know, we start checking around. Where's the sin? Lord, what did I do? What did I do? We go through this. Where did I go wrong is the question that services. It's a real question. And you know what? It, 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 it moves us to that place of doubt where all of a sudden... It overshadows us. Our hearts become exhausted in going back and forth, trying to discover, trying to figure out, okay, what is the sin? What is the problem here? And we wrestle with those silly little questions of the unknowns and the what ifs. We go back and forth. We vacillate between two particular points. But as we look at this text, gang, there is a huge key of hope here, and I don't want us to miss it. Because it's going to do something. It's going to settle our hearts, and it's going to cause us to be able to answer this question with certainty. Did I get it right? It's a question that we all answer. It's, all, it's a question that we even ask ourselves from time to time. Look at verse number 23 again. We're going to back up just a shade here. And here's what he says. Matthew writing again. He says, now, when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him. In Mark 4 and 35, Jesus says this. He says, let us cross over to the other side. He virtually says the exact same thing in Luke chapter 8. Let us cross over to the other side. And gang, it's a point that we can't miss because this particular storm, it came as the disciples that they were following the direction of Jesus. They were right there in that place where they were in a place of obedience. They were in a place of submission. They were in this place where they were walking with God. And the storm was there. And when we recognize from a scriptural standpoint that we will fall into storms, when we see that, we can go to that place where we can crush the doubt out of our life. Where we can answer that question, did I get it right? We can answer it with certainty. And we can move to that place of walking with confidence. And when the trials come, as Paul would say, in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, he says, none of these things move me. Man. Apostle Paul would also say, follow me in 1 Corinthians. Follow me as I follow Christ. And, and, and God did a work in, his, in Paul's life in such a way, and he's doing that same work, gang, in our lives. 
And then when these trials fall upon us, we've got the certainty and the security of the scriptures of knowing how to pick this up, to use it, apply it to the circumstances that are right before us so that we can discern, wait a minute, did I get it right? Am I walking this out according to what God has said or am I in a different place? And this is the point where we're going we're gonna to add um, something here. You know, in our society, there are so many different programs that are out there. These are programs, surely with the best intent, no doubt. But they're programs that try to reform the flesh. Do that in English. They're programs that try to reform the flesh. What did Jesus say about the flesh? What are we supposed to do with the flesh? We're supposed to crucify it, to crucify the flesh, to crucify it, not to reform it. You know, we're, we're, we're to render it dead. You know, and I was just kind of searching around, kind of around, I guess, our, our state and the different programs that are out there. These are just the illustrated purposes. purposes. They're, it's to make a point, so... Um, you know, I'm not one of those guys that, that dogs on things. I teach the scripture, but I'm trying to amplify something here with us because it's a real problem that has propped up in our society. It's popped up in the church, the church, big church. You know, the, these, these different programs that are out there. I'm going to give you a few of them. You're going to, you're going to recognize them right off the top. But these are things that try to reform the flesh. And the only reason that I'm just casually mentioning these is so that we don't get caught in them. So that we don't begin to put weight upon that and to realize that, well, yeah, well, maybe I can reform the flesh if I just do X, Y, and Z. No, 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 no. Jesus said to crucify the flesh, to render it dead. Alcoholics Anonymous. That's one that we all, we all know. It's a 12-step program. Here's another one. Maybe not so many know about this one. Clutterers Anonymous. You have a cluttered house? Maybe you could seek 12 steps to help you. Codependency, Anonymous. Debtors, Anonymous. Emotions, Anonymous. These are real, right here in our state. Food Addicts, Anonymous. Gamblers, Anonymous. A more serious one, Heroin, Anonymous. Marijuana, Anonymous. Narcotics, Anonymous. Nicotine, Anonymous. Overeaters, Anonymous. Online Gamers, Anonymous. You're online, who knows you anyways? Wait for it, it'll come. <laughs> yep, it came. <laughs> Sexaholic Anonymous. Survivors of Incest Anonymous. And I want to be careful there, but I'm not, I'm not trying to poke fun. Um, here's one that I actually did find comical. Under Earners Anonymous. <laughs> Dang. There's all types of programs that are out there, and if we're not careful, we fall into the the processes and the trends that are going through our society. And we, we, could, we could move to this place where the sufficiency of Christ is wiped to the side. And I want us to be able to recognize, again, I'm not here bashing on the program. That's not, that's not the deal. That's not what we're talking about. But we are talking about something, and that is the sufficiency of Christ, that that doubt, when the storms fall upon our life, that that doubt would be washed away. That we would understand that our God is able to carry us through all these things. Listen, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 that therefore if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. And listen to this. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. they become new. The presence, the resurrection power and presence of God's Holy Spirit in yours and my life. When we accept Jesus into our life, we are overcomers, gang. Joel 2.25 would talk about that he restores the years that the locust has eaten. Romans 12 and 2 tells us, you know, to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And now all of a sudden the road is getting a little bit narrow again. Because in order for us to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, guess what we have to do? We've got to get into it. And once we get into it, you know, uh, Romans 10 and 17 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Our lives are changed. But so often the flavor of opening this up for ourselves becomes intimidating. 
It becomes confusing. Well, I don't know what the Bible says. All of these doubts, if you will, they wash over us. Galatians 3, 1 to 3, it says, If you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. For Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. And, and, and check this out. It says, set your mind on the things above, not on the things of the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. We run into problems, Philippians 4, 6 to 7. It says to be anxious for nothing. But to go to that place where we pray. Why? Because it's in that place where you're there and you're focusing upon God and you're lifting the problems up to Him in your own voice that suddenly it's the peace of God which surpasses all understanding and guards your heart and your mind. And I don't know how you are, but when I fall into these particular storms, the first thing that go is my heart, my emotions. We can agree with that. My emotions get stirred. The second thing that goes out the door is my mind. I lose my mind. My wife tells me all the time, you've lost your mind. <laughs> in other words, clear thinking. Our clear thinking in the process to be able to navigate through this stuff and the, the things that are right before us. Yeah, we do get better with it. You know, we, we do get better with trying to push these things off, you know, the progression of age. But Jesus says, wait a minute. You bring this stuff to me. And he says, I'm going to give you the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Literally, he sets an army around your heart and your mind. He's the one that's keeping you stable and still. Right in the middle of all that. And the point is, is that as we learn what it means to walk as Christians, as we learn what this means, again, we understand that it's, it's the resurrection power of Christ in us. And when the storms come, we don't turn and we don't run to that place of doubt. We don't, we don't flee out of there. You know, by bailing on God and saying, oh, God, my God's not able. I've got to turn to this. I've got to turn to that. I've got to exercise these particular helps, if you will. It's not reformation of self. You know, let me magnify it a little bit farther because I, I, I don't want to come across this with just, um, you know, I, I don't want to be crass. I don't want to be insensitive to these things. And, and nor am I looking to go to that place of saying redundant information, things that you all know, things that you have all heard. But I do want to make it real to us because there's a legitimate pain in life. And Jesus really comes to touch us and to help us. Gang, when I was sitting in the back room here on the side before service started, the Lord put these thoughts upon my mind about what's happening in this room, right here, this room. But there are people that are here, and I just wrote them down and stuck them right in my little Bible here. There's people here that are wrestling with doubt. There's people that are here that are wrestling with discouragement, frustration, sorrows, questions. Right in this room. They're, they're, they're walking through these difficult storms, if you will. And it's only the hand of God that will help save. But the trend that has fallen in our, into our society, and, and, and it e it's even growing greater and greater within the church, is that everyone needs a professional counselor in their life. And you hear these people heralding this even in the church. Now listen, I need to make sure I qualify this. And I'm not looking to step on a soapbox, so I'm going to be hypersensitive about this. I'm not saying that there's not situations where, um, you know, there's extreme situations where there's extra measures that need to be taken with the doctor. I'm not on that. I'm not one of those weirdos that says, no, no, nothing. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is this, is that I'm combating the cultural trends with the light of God's word. And you guys are new creations in Christ just like I am. And we've gone to this electronic society, gang, and in that electronic society, we, we have eroded the face-to-face -face relationships. You know, there's a classic Toyota commercial. We were talking about it at uh, community groups this past week. Uh, and maybe you guys remember it from about a year ago or so. There's this young college girl. She's sitting at her, um, you know, her, her dinner table or whatever in her house, and she's on a, com a computer. She's all stoked and happy. I've got 900 friends. There she sits alone in her dining room on the computer, her parents, you know, empty nesters in that place of retirement, they're out with a bunch of people riding bikes, doing adventure, doing all this crazy stuff. You know, and, and, and this electronics that is supposed to broaden our relationships, I get the dynamic of it. I understand like that. You know, hey, listen, I'm a user of social media as well. But listen, gang, when the face-to-face -face relationships deteriorate, all of a sudden we go to this place, you know, and, and, and the byproduct within our society is, is that people are paying more and more money to have a complete stranger tell them what to do. 
It's a powerful thing if we consider it. Because God is, is, is he's supplied everything that we absolutely need. It's right here. He's given us to that. But the doubt comes in. Because you drop that saying, which is something that Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In other words, the sufficiency of Christ is there for every situation that you and I will ever face. And when we drop that saying down there, why is it that we doubt it when it comes to practical steps? Did I get this right? And we begin to question it. Listen, the church culture within it, follow with me to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2. Some of you are very familiar with this particular text. Uh, Acts, right at the very beginning of Acts chapter 2, I guess. You know, we find here that on the, uh, the day of Pentecost, which was nothing more than 50 days after Passover, <clears throat> Jesus had already risen, went to heaven. The early disciples were hanging out and, and uh, you know, waiting for the Lord. And we get down to verse number 2. It says, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven of a rushing mighty wind. And the story behind this was, listen, there's a legitimate sound, but if you read the text, it says, As of... A rushing mighty wind. So we know we're talking about a metaphor now. It was as of. This was the best way that they could describe it using, you know, whatever language there. as to what was taking place. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then it appeared to them divided tongues. Watch again. As of fire. Again, it's a metaphor. And one sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and they were confused because everyone heard them speaking in his own language. And then all were amazed and marveled, saying to one another, look, are not all these who speak Galileans? Here's the picture. God was doing a supernatural work to get his, his word out. And as we follow along all the way over to verse, verse number 42, we get to this place. And we see that God began to work in that way. And then all of a sudden people were added to the church. And we get to verse number 42 and it says, And they, speaking of the disciples and those that were coming to the Lord, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. There was community, gang. That's the whole point. There was community. They valued each other, and in the middle of that, they were counseling each other back and forth, if you will. There was legitimate friends that you can go to to look in the eye face to face and say, hey, man, I'm struggling with this. Can you help me? Can you help me? Can you be there? You know, the ministry of presence, as we like to call it, in the place when somebody suffers sickness or, or, or death, the ministry of presence, there's something to be said about that. Colossians 3.16, it tells us, it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another. Admonishing one another. You know, the word is, um, the Greek word, nuthatawo. We get it out of Romans 15 and 14 as well. And you know what it is? It's the foundation word that we use for biblical counseling. That we take this word right here, we, English, we admonish, one another. The idea is coming, uh, again, biblical counseling. The idea is it's pulled from the word admonish. We admonish one another from the scriptures. It's not us running off to, to somebody else that we don't know to capture advice that we don't need. And it's very important, gang, that we, that we recognize this because I know it becomes a very real struggle within our society. And I know it's a very real struggle within this church. My intent is, is not to move anybody to a place of of feeling pushed out or left out, but my, my intent is this, is that the sufficiency of Christ is great. And Jesus wants to touch our lives. He wants to work in our lives. He wants to do a mighty work. And we sit here in a place, we're at a crossroads in some regards. Hey, listen, you know, the, the question of the day, did I get it right? By following Jesus, did I get it right? By staying on that narrow path, did I get it right? The Christian counseling that was given to me from somebody within my church or my in the spear of the body of Christ, that they, they gave it to me here, and I got the same thing over here. Wait a minute. Are they getting it right? You know, is this stuff that I should be following? It's a powerful question, gang. 
It's not about reforming our flesh. And so as we begin to, to wind down a little here, I want to make sure that I add a few things on top of that uh, and, then, and then give us a kind of a tool here at the very end. Uh, John 6, in John chapter 6, it said that Jesus said this in verses 63 to 64. He says, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh, it profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. Listen. Jesus speaks to the heart of man. And as he speaks to the heart of man, he's not here to put us under some wacky religious system. He's not calling us to go on, stand on the side of the road and do jumping jacks and say, hey, love Jesus. And once in a while, jump out in the street when the stoplight happens. He's not calling us to weird stuff like that. You have fake red lights. Somebody get ran over. I don't know. No. Listen, he's a real God. He really loves us. And he really, he really wants to help us. He wants to help us walk through these things within our life, but it's not about reforming the flesh. It's about a slow process of sanctification that we go to. It's not about perfect lives. We're not here about perfect lives. We're here to understand that we need the grace of God, and we've seen that. We've seen the grace of God in these, you know, at the beginning of this chapter poured out, which ministered to us greatly. But the response comes back to you and I, and that is what will we do with it? Do I believe that he has the words of life? Or will I take control of my own life and use, here it is, watch, wait for it, common sense. Well, I'm just going to use common sense. If it's common sense, why are there so few people that have it? It's common. Really. Just stay on I-25 for a segment of time. See who's got common sense. My wife is a bad driver. That's why I said that. No, I'm <laughs> See, now you're listening. <laughs> I'm so kidding. She's a good driver. I'm a terrible driver. She's sitting. <laughs> the bumper sticker says, honk if you love Jesus. I'm just honking because I love Jesus. <laughs> oh, you guys are crazy. I'm embarrassed, actually. That's not cool. <laughs> it's a good time to take a water break. So we'll be back in. <laughs> um, listen, at the end of the time, um, you know, at the end of our time. Guys, time goes so fast. Listen, guys, I just want you to trust Jesus. I want you to be able to take and um, to practically apply biblical truth, to understand that um, God is relevant in your life, that the scriptures are relevant. You know, uh, Hebrews 4 would tell us that the word of God is a, alive and living and powerful. It's alive. It can speak to your situation. But let me give you a little contrast because if you're here this morning in a storm, I want to make sure that you understand both sides before we put the capstone on this. Um, follow with me to your left. Let's go to the book of Jonah. Now, if you're in Matthew, and if you could see up front, you're only going to turn to your left about 50 pages or so. And that's a guess. If you've gone to Amos or Obadiah, you've gone too far. If you're in Micah, Nahum, or Habakkuk, you haven't gone far enough. But it's the book of Jonah. If you can't find it, don't worry about it. I'll read it out to you here. But in the book of Jonah, we find that Jonah was in a storm of disobedience. In the very first uh, chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up, uh, have come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And he went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. And so he paid the fare, and he went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And we find here that God's word gave him some direction, that God spoke to him. He was a prophet. He said, arise. God told him what to do. He told him where to go. And what did Jonah do? He went the other way. So gang, pay attention. If you heard nothing else that I've said all day, pay attention to these last three, four minutes, five minutes. Give myself a little time. These last five minutes. Just pay attention to this, okay? Jonah was given a word. He went the other way. And in that process of fleeing the other way, we find that we get all the way down to verse number five. It says, Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God, and they threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, had laid down, and was fast asleep. 
Jesus was asleep because he had been engaged in ministry and he was tired. Jonah was asleep because he had become callous to God's word. He became insensitive. And he fell into that place of disobedience. And in his disobedience, he went to sleep. He disregarded the word of God. And now if a storm falls upon your life because you have disregarded the word of God, then God's intent of bringing that storm is to shake you up that you might come back to your senses. According to Leviticus 26, it's to break your stubborn pride. That's not a good storm to be in, a storm of disobedience. And if you're going through rough times today because you know that you've walked away from not trusting in the sufficiency of Christ and you still have the ramifications and you still have the details and you still have the disaster that is looming day by day in your life, maybe you need to stop and look around. Wait a minute. Jesus, have you spoken something that I'm not getting? God will show you because he doesn't want you to stay there. He will walk you out of it. But if you're here this morning and you're going through that perfect storm because you've been following Jesus, because you're in that place of obedience, just like the disciples were today, then gang, you need to hold on because your God is going to see you through to the other side. He is with you. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. But when somebody brings us this word and, and puts it into our lap and you find it offensive because of what they've spoken, let us recognize that it is an act of love, even though it might not resonate with the pride of man, even though it might not resonate with our own self-sufficiency, if you will. If it is God's word, we are to live by it. We are to walk this out. We are to apply it to our lives. And when the storms come in those circumstances, we are to remain steadfast, resolute of understanding that he's leading and this is a storm out of obedience. It's not a storm out of disobedience. It's not a storm because I have not followed God's ways. It's a storm because I'm right in the middle of his perfect will. And the power or that peace of God which surpasses all understanding will resonate upon your heart, your emotions, and your mind. The thoughts that go through your mind. Your mind, mind, double mind. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? And so I believe that this particular section of text that we looked at here in, in Matthew 8 is a powerful reminder for us. It's a powerful reminder for us, just as he spoke to the disciples in verse 26. He says, why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Why are you fearful? The Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 1 and 7, he says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. He has given us that. The sufficiency in what Christ has deposited into our life is more than enough. But you have to answer the question personally. Did I get it right? If you've chosen Jesus and you remain in Jesus, you've gotten it right for time and eternity. And you will get through the storms that you are currently in. But if you're resisting him, know this, that if you are a child of God, that he will chasten you because his desire is that you would have his perfect love in your life. So I want to encourage you, gang. Press on with Jesus. Recognize that when you make that decision, there's great times and there's tough times. But regardless of the time, if you're walking it out in Jesus, he is with you. And he will see you through to the other side. Thanks for joining us today. If you want to know more about having a real relationship with God, click the Do You Know Him link under the Resources tab at westminstercalvary.org. We also would like to encourage you to join us Sunday mornings at 9 or 1030. For more information, please contact our church offices at 303-223-4640.